Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome today uh, Dr. Carol Fekhri from uh, Hopkins. Uh, Dr. Fekhri is uh, an associate professor in the Department of uh, Medicine, Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, as well as Epidemiology at Hopkins. Uh, she did her undergrad uh, at Stanford and then uh, received her MD from Hopkins and subsequently uh, received an MPH from the School of Public Health um, that has been probably around 10 years ago now. Uh, she subsequently did her residency in head and neck surgery and managed to squeeze in a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in molecular epidemiology. Subsequently, she completed a fellowship in head and neck surgery. Um, if you know anything about uh, HPV uh, risk factors and H the epidemiology of HPV-related oropharynx cancer, you should have come across the work that Carol has, has done. She has really been at the forefront of uh, understanding uh, the epidemiology of uh, HPV-related disease and the risk factors for this disease. Uh, Carol is on multiple uh, national and international committees. She has received uh, several awards. I'm not going to mention uh, all of this, but uh, she is currently on the NCI uh, steering committee for head and neck cancer. Uh, she also is currently the chair uh, of the American Head and Neck Society Survivorship Committee. Uh, Carol has more than 80 peer-reviewed publications, including 13 book chapters, and uh, I think she's first authored on all of these chapters, pretty much. <laughs> uh, uh, without further uh, delay, uh, it's a pleasure to have Carol here, uh, and uh, she's going to talk to us about the evolving landscape of HPV-related head and neck cancer. Carol, we extend to you a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Nabila. That was a very kind introduction. Um, it's a huge honor to be here, so thank you for the invitation um, to uh, give grand rounds at the Winship Cancer Institute. Um, so this was the face of head and neck cancer in the last few decades, and then more recently, this is the face of uh, head and neck cancer. So we're seeing an evolution. So we're seeing an evolving epidemiology of um, head and neck cancer. What we've seen um, over time is a rise of oropharyngeal cancer and a decline in smoking-related cancers such as oral cavity cancers. And this is from U.S. data um, using the SEER um, database. And these incidence trends are most prominent among men. So if you uh, look at the left panel, this is incidence trends of oropharyngeal cancer in the United States using SEER data um, for men. And uh, these are the incidence trends for women. And what jumps out at you at first is that overall, incidence trends among women have largely been unchanged. But you see these dramatic increases among um, men. And these are uh, for each uh, age cohort, and so I'll bring your attention, for example, to 55, 59-year-old men um, uh, here. And what you see, 55, 59-year-old men, their risk of cancer in the 1930s was here, and more recently, they've had a dramatic rise um, in their risk of oropharyngeal cancer. So we've seen these incidence trends um, more particularly in men and in more recent birth cohorts. And just to show it in another way, um, this is essentially a heat map with the yellow being um, highest incidence in men relative to women. On this axis are the age groups, so youngest age groups here. And then um, this is calendar time with most recent calendar time here. And what you note is that the incidence of oropharyngeal cancer is dramatically higher in men um, relative to women in more recent um, calendar periods and in younger age cohorts. Um, so if we look kind of over time, what's happened in the United States, um, you see, again, big strokes. Um, we looked at this in uh, recent SEER data. From 1975 to 2012, there's been a 63% increase in the incidence of oropharyngeal cancer in the United States. And um, consistent with incidence trends, this is most, um, uh, most dramatic among men. So an 82% increase from 1975 to 2012 among men, among whites, and in younger age groups. And this is really attributable to HPV-positive tumor status. So Anil Shatterbadi, back in 2010, 
and Mara Gilson elegantly showed using gold standard HPV detection methods um, that there was a dramatic rise in the um, uh, tumors attributable to HPV and a dramatic decline in tumors um, not attributable um, to HPV. We think that this is due to a successful public health tobacco cessation campaign um, uh, in this country because we've seen a decline in oral cavity cancers, larynx cancers, and other head and neck cancers during the same, same time period, but this dramatic rise in oropharynx cancers. Using this data, which was back in um, late 2008-2009, SEER data, um, and the cutoff was about 2004, as you can see here, they projected forward, and they projected a continued increase, an epidemic in HPV-associated oropharynx cancers, and that in 2025, it would overtake cervical cancers, the paradigm of HPV-related malignancies um, in this country. And uh, some of the figures I showed you earlier was um, using more recent SEER data up to 2012. And so those estimates um, and of overtaking cervical cancer appear to be robust. And so they were actually conservative estimates using the data in 2004. And um, so we don't think that that was an overestimation um, when we did the calculations about a year ago. So, as I said, it's all due to HPV. We now know that HPV is a causal agent for a subset of oropharyngeal cancer, which is um, rising. And um, oral HPV infection and a case control study is strongly associated with diagnosis of oropharyngeal cancer and other measures of exposure to HPV, so sexual partners and E6, E7 oncogene um, antibodies to E6 and E7 oncogenes is also strongly associated with diagnosis of oropharyngeal cancer. So what are the risk factors for oral HPV infection? Exposure to HPV infection by sex, increasing number of lifetime oral sex partners, any vaginal sex partners, um, age of younger coitarchy, marijuana use, cigarette use, immunosuppression, and women who have a history of a prior cervical HPV infection also are more likely to have an oral HPV infection. Using NHANES data, Maura Gillison and Anil Shadervedi showed that there's a dose response. With increasing number of partners, the prevalence of oral HPV infection goes up. And this is um, using US-based population data and it's cross-sectional data. Um, we see that there's this dose response with um, sexual exposure. The other thing that uh, is very interesting from this data is that we see that, again, mirroring the incidence trends that I showed you earlier, where men have higher incidence of oropharyngeal cancer than women, when you look at prevalence of oral HPV infection in the United States, again, it stands out that the prevalence is dramatically higher for men than it is for women. You also see this bimodal distribution with an earlier peak and a later peak um, in the U.S. population of oral HPV infection. You see a similar bimodal distribution among women, but it's really attenuated, and it's much more dramatic um, when you look at it for men. One around the 30s and one later um, in the uh, 50s. So uh, in addition to sexual behavior, tobacco appears to be a strong um, risk factor for oral HPV infection. So we used the NHANES data, I did this with Amber D'Souza, we used the NHANES data and looked at um, cotinine and urinary NNALs. Um, which are biomarkers for current tobacco use. And what we found is a very strong dose response increase in the prevalence of oral HPV infection when you look at biomarkers of current tobacco use. Um, you saw a similar dose response relationship for NNALs, and then when we looked at it as a continuous measure, so if you look at a log base of cotinine, which I had no idea what it meant, but if you extrapolate from that and convert it to cigarettes, per three cigarettes, that's associated with 34% increase in the odds of having an oral HPV-16 infection, which is the type of infection that's responsible for 95% of oropharynx cancers. So that was much stronger than I expected it to be. And then the other um, interesting thing about oral HPV um, infection, um, which also somewhat mirrors um, the incidence trends we see, is that there are racial differences in the prevalence of oral HPV infection. So when you look among high-risk infections, um, the prevalence is highest among whites and, um, and blacks. So I've shown you a bunch of prevalence data. We actually don't have the benefit of natural history studies like we do for cervical HPV infections 
um, going from infection, factors that um, reactivate and clear infection, going on to pre-malignancy, and then to malignancy. So that's all unknown, and it's an area of active interest, um, but we probably won't have that data for another five to seven years, I would say. Um, so the only natural history data we have is very limited, so I'm just gonna show it to you. Um, uh, this is an Amy Kramer study. Um, she looked at uh, men um, to see what the incidence and factors associated with short-term incidence and clearance of infection are. And what you see is that the incidence of infection among men is actually pretty low, so 1%, but most people end up clear, sorry, less than 1%, here's the incidence. Um, and among the people who get the infection, by and large, everyone clears it by 18 months. So median duration of oral HPV infection is about seven months. Factors associated with new infection are current smoking, being single, having increased exposure to oral HPV infection, no prior history of um, tonsillectomy. So as I said, we don't really know the whole continuum from exposure, um, persistence of infection to cancer. So I'm gonna jump straight to cancer and we can extrapolate it from case control studies and the data that we have. Um, so just as uh, uh, sexual behaviors are associated with oral HPV infection, um, the presumed precursor for um, HPV-associated oropharynx cancers, the same behaviors are strongly associated with the diagnosis of HPV-positive oropharyngeal cancer. So now we know that HPV-positive oropharyngeal cancers are a distinct clinical entity from HPV-negative oropharyngeal cancer because they really have two distinct risk factor profiles. So HPV-positive cancers are associated with sexual behaviors and marijuana, which I haven't discussed at length. Um, and what, meanwhile, HPV-negative cancers are associated with poor dental hygiene, tobacco use, and alcohol use. So how is HPV tumor status relevant clinically? It's relevant in terms of the clinical demographic profile of a patient. Um, it's relevant at the time of diagnosis, and it's relevant in terms of prognosis. Um, so mirroring the incidence um, trends that I showed you earlier, um, HPV-positive patients tend to be younger on average. They're more likely to be white, more likely to be married, college-educated, and of higher socioeconomic status, so they also have higher median household incomes um, as compared to HPV-negative patients. They also tend to have improved performance status. They're less likely to be anemic or have other comorbidities, and they're less likely that to be non-smokers, I'm sorry, more likely to be non-smokers and have less um, cumulative tobacco exposure. That being said, about 50% of HPV-positive patients um, are smokers. So uh, it's when you compare them, there's a statistical difference, but um, I don't want you to come away from this thinking that all HIV positive patients are non-smokers. There are just more of them. Um, so we did a large study um, uh, at Hopkins with UCSF and um, wanted to further examine this clinical demographic profile of patients um, since you know, we have this impression that it's mostly among men and mostly among women. So when we tested a large number of tumors, I think it was about 700 tumors, what we found was that most tumors in the current day and age of, among women are HPV positive. And just as we've seen an increase in HPV positive cancers among men, um, we've seen an increase in HPV positive cancers um, among women. And similarly, when we look at non-whites, um, in this day and age, most um, cancers among non-whites are HPV um, positive, and you see that there is an increase um, over time. So while most HPV positive ca cancers compared to HPV negative cancers are more likely to rise in whites and in men, in this day and age, if an oropharynx cancer patient shows up at your door and they're non-white and they're not a man, they're still, odds are they're still going to be um, HPV positive, despite being more rare in terms of incidence. Um, so uh, as I said earlier, it's really specific to the oropharynx. Um, HPV positive cancers arise from the palatine and lingual um, tonsil tissue, um, where you have lymphoid tissue. Um, they're small primary tumors, and so they're more likely to present as unknown primaries. They have advanced nodal stage, which in the current AJCC staging system, the seventh stage uh, addition stage system, uh, makes them advanced overall stage. But in the new staging system that will come out in a few months, they will all be very early overall stage. They're gonna all go to overall stage one, essentially. Um, and just to reinforce that most of these tumors are really, it's characteristic of the oropharynx. When um, we tested um, 
you know, about 623 um, tumors. Um, uh, outside of the oropharynx, only 4% were HPV positive. And we used gold standard detection. We had one head and neck pathologist look at all these tumors. And so this is really specific to the oropharynx, and really only oropharynx cancers um, should be tested. And we can apply kind of the clinical um, features of oropharynx cancers, uh, of HPV positive cancers, only to oropharynx cancers. Um, so um, HPV also is applicable in terms of prognosis. Um, so in actually the first um, prospective study, um, we looked at this. Um, we found that um, in a study of, uh, within ECOG that was induction chemotherapy and concurrent chemoradiation, HPV-positive patients had significantly improved overall survival as compared to HPV-negative patients. Similarly, they had improved progression-free survival as compared to HPV um, negative patients. So that was the first study. We only had two-year survival data at that point. This is um, a study, a multi a Hopkins and UCSF study that we recently did, which gives you really long-term um, survival data in a very diverse patient population where we enriched for women, we enriched for non-whites, and you see that the survival benefit continues um, over time. So HPV tumor status is associated um, with the prognostic factors, including tumor stage and um, performance status. It is an independent marker of prognosis, and that prognostic advantage is decreased by smoking. In a landmark study, um, in RTOG 0129, um, uh, the group did a recursive partitioning. It was uh, led by Maura Gilson and Kian Ang, um, and they did a recursive partitioning to identify factors associated with um, overall survival. And what they showed us is that there's a low risk group, intermediate risk group, and high risk group. The HPV positive patients all fall into the low risk and intermediate risk group. Um, the, what I, the best group of the HPV positive are really the non-smokers with low burden of disease. The intermediate risk group are those who have advanced nodal stage and um, smokers. And then among the HPV negative patients, where most HPV negative patients fall, um, they have high smoking with a few um, caveats. And so this was based on three-year survival um, data. And using that, we've really come to the point in the field where we're asking questions about, should we de-incensify these patients? We know that they're younger. We know that they have better prognosis. We know that they're going to live longer. Can we get away with treating them with less? And does that mean with less radiation? Which agent do we use um, in terms of chemotherapy? Do we introduce surgery into the um, mix? But in order to really identify who to de-intensify, we really have to be able to risk stratify these patients better. And we have to know who we can go down on their therapy so that we can actually save those people. Um, and so I think, to me, that's one of the big questions, is how do we risk stratify these um, patients? And that has also um, implications in terms of um, surveillance um, for these patients. And, you know, I think for us it was really exciting in the mid-2000s so we figured out that HPV-positive patients do better than HPV-negative patients, but there's clearly more to the story than that, and we can't keep on comparing it to HPV-negative patients, and we really have to start to identify the different phenotypes among HPV-positive oropharynx cancers, and I think that's really kind of where we are now um, as a field. So we've learned a lot, and I'm going to just tell you two studies um, which... Um, um, cooperative group studies in RTOG, and um, I'm pre going to present data based on them, so I'm just going to kind of give you a brief overview of the studies. So RTOG 0129 um, enrolled patients with local regionally advanced um, head and neck cancers and was comparing standard fractionation with uh, accelerated fractionation with concomitant boost um, and concomitant um, cisplatin. RTOG 0522 also advanced local regional um, head and neck cancer and it was um, comparing the addition of cetuximab um, to cisplatin-based um, accelerated fractionation with concomitant boost, or IMRT. In both of these studies, they had fairly rigorous surveillance as these patients were prospectively um, followed. We have cumulative tobacco exposure from um, time of enrollment. And for some patients, not all of the patients, we have P16, which is a surrogate um, in oropharynx cancers for HPV tumor status. So going forward, I'll use the terms P16 positive and HPV positive, or my slides will um, interchangeably. So P16 positive is, our, um, is a surrogate for HPV positive um, tumors. So I showed you earlier um, the Kian Ang, Mara Gelson um, uh, landmark paper, which showed us the um, risk groups. 
Um, but it's actually never been reproduced um, in any other um, studies, not because it's not reproducible, because no one has done it. Um, so we recently did a reproducibility study in 0522, and what we want to see is whether or not there was durability of those survival estimates years out. And so what we found is that it is reproducible, the risk group stratification, and there is durability. So at five years, you still have similar survival um, estimates going forward. Um, now, similarly for progression-free survival, those risk groups are reproducible and you see durability. The one thing I will point out is that the low risk group, which is the group that we're all trying to um, uh, de-intensify therapy, their progression-free survival at five years in 05 to 2 was 73%, um, which makes me a little bit uncomfortable uh, because I think it's high, there are more events than we had expected. Um, when you compare that to 0129, at five years, it's 88%. And so there is variability, and I think that, um, you know, I think it's an important thing um, for us as a community to wrestle with. Um, so right now, among HIV positive and HIV negative, as I said earlier, there are two categories of risk for HIV positive, low, and intermediate, for HPV negative, intermediate, and um, high risk. And we really have to struggle with, you know, and wrestle with what are we comfortable with for deintensification. De um, and I think that, as I just showed you from the 0522 data, there is variability in the progression of disease among the low-risk group. So I don't know that we should, that's definitely the group to de-intensify just without thinking about it further. That being said, that made us think about better ways of risk stratifying patients. Um, and so what we've recently developed is a nomogram um, uh, to, in, for oropharynx cancers to risk stratify patients. Um, and so we use RTOG 0129 and 0522 as our derivation cohort. We use another very different RTOG study um, uh, from an earlier time, 9003, as our validation cohort. Um, and I just point this out, the characteristics of the study population, because there are differences between the two cohorts, for example, um, in terms of social um, factors, smoking history, there were a lot more smokers in 9003 than there were um, in 0129, 0522, and that probably reflects the times, because I think 9003 was a study in the 90s, and 0129 and 0522 were um, later, earlier in the 2000s. Um, there are differences in HPV tumor status um, between the two study with um, fewer HPV positive tumors um, among the 9003 validation cohort and differences in nodal disease. So we've um, performed uh, COX models, accounting for many factors that were available for overall survival, and this model really had the best fit in terms of overall survival. And so what we found was that age um, has a significant interaction with pack years. So um, patients who were older than 50 and had less than 10 pack years of um, tobacco exposure are at significantly increased risk um, for death. Um, if a patient has uh, greater than 10 pack years of smoking and is younger than 50, that patient's also at increased risk of um, death. Other factors that are associated with um, uh, survival are performance status, education, anemia, HPV tumor status, tumor stage, and um, nodal stage. So the model actually had pretty good calibration except for at lower um, survival when we compared the predicted overall survival with um, the uh, observed um, five-year overall survival. And from that, we were able to create a nomogram for overall survival. Um, so I, I'm in a room full of oncologists. I'm sure you guys know what nomograms are, but as a head and neck surgeon, um, when I was trying to figure out, you know, how do I show weighted, um, weighted uh, risks of um, death and for each accounting for more variables, I had to um, learn a lot about um, nomograms before I finally arrived to, aha, I need a nomogram to improve our risk stratification. Um, so for each variable, you get a number of points, and then you tally up all your points, which gives you a um, survival um, uh, estimate. So we have two-year overall survival and five-year overall survival. Um, and so to me, what's interesting is the thing that gives you the biggest amount of points is this interaction between age and tobacco use um, when we consider overall survival. And then the next um, biggest thing to influence survival is HPV um, tumor status. Um, and as you can see here, with increasing number of points, survival decreases for patients. So um, 
in black is a two-year overall survival, and gray is five-year overall um, survival. We did a similar, similar thing for progression-free survival. The factors associated with progression-free survival are different than the factors associated with overall survival in the final model. There's an interaction between performance status um, and HPV tumor status. Um, weight loss at enrollment and study is strongly associated with survival. Um, education, marital status are also included um, in the progression-free model. Similarly, it had pretty good calibration, and um, this is the nomogram so that um, both patients and providers can look at what their personalized estimate of survival um, would be. And again, here, the factor that, so that um, determines survival most greatly is the interaction between performance status and HPV um, tumor status. Um, and uh, similar to the overall survival curve I showed you, increasing number of points, as you would expect, is associated with worse predicted overall survival. So this is nine, the schema for 9003. As I said, that this study was in an earlier um, calendar period. I think it was in the late 19, uh, 1990s um, that the, um, the study um, enrolled. And patients were treated on this study, and it looked at different um, strategies for, um, for radiation um, therapy. Um, so we did this so that we could externally validate this, the nomogram. We had internal validation um, uh, performed, which I showed you from the calibration plots and other um, concordance indices that we did, um, but we also want to externally validate it. So for um, patients in RTOG 9003, we applied the nomogram, and then um, they got their scores, and then we divided it into tertiles, and as you can see, there are significant differences in um, survival by um, tertiles. So um, we uh, developed and validated a nomogram for advanced oropharyngeal cancer, um, uh, which allows us to predict overall and progression-free survival at two and five years. And this is for patients who are treated with primary um, radiation. So this will not be applicable necessarily to patients who are treated um, with uh, surgery. And so for us in head and neck, it's really great because, um, I think it'll be really great, I should say, um, because there are a lot of features when you walk into the room and you see that cachectic old person or, you know, you, you understand that there are all these factors that are um, social or from your history, which really don't factor into our RPA analysis where we have low intermediate and risk um, and high risk um, categories. And so now we can kind of put a number, how that translates into um, their um, survival and it's patient specific. And we might be able to use it, I think, for clinical trials to really wrestle with what's our cutoff. The 10% progression-free survival is our low risk group um, or something like that. Um, so despite HPV positive patients having improved prognosis, at three years, up to 25% still experience disease progression. Um, so 17% uh, at three years have had a local regional progression, and up to 7% have had uh, distant um, metastases. So despite having good overall prognosis, progression of disease is still an issue. Historically, in oropharynx cancer, a, um, a progression of disease heralded death. Patients with um, oropharynx cancer had dismal um, prognosis. And so we didn't know what it meant, um, you know, a few years ago, if an HU positive patient who we thought had good prognosis showed up in our clinic and had a recurrence. Um, and so we didn't even know how to counsel them or how to, um, and, you know, what to tell them. So uh, we used RTOG data um, to compare HU positive and HU negative patients with disease progression to compare them by patient characteristics, time to disease progression, distribution of anatomic sites, and their survival after disease um, progression. Um, so when you compare the characteristics of HPV positive patients with um, disease progression to HPV negative patients with um, disease progression, I used to always think that the HPV positive patients who had disease progression must be very close and must be the ones who are most closely resemble HPV negative patients because they're not doing well. Um, and so I, I thought that they would actually have similar clinical characteristics. It turns out that HPV positive patients with time disease progression are more likely to be white. They're more likely to have a decreased smoking um, history. They are more likely to have tumors at the base of tongue and the tonsil. 
as compared to other oropharynx um, subsites. They're more likely to have earlier tumor stage, and they will be more likely to have received um, more cycles of their chemotherapy on trial. Um, and then interestingly, HE positive patients and HE negative patients had no difference in terms of their disease progression. So to back up, I just, the, the reason I think that's important is that HE positive patients retain their phenotype even at the time of disease progression. So they are not necessarily the patients that are most closely resemble HB negative patients. Um, and most disease progressions occur within the first year. There was also a lot of um, data in the, or case uh, reports um, uh, in the literature about um, a different phenotype of disease progression for HE positive as compared to HB negative patients. But when we looked at it, there was actually no difference in the distribution of first disease progression um, among HB positive and HB negative patients. So what does it mean once a patient has um, a recurrence? So HB tumor status is associated with improved overall survival despite disease progression. Um, and uh, survival is a uh, greater than twofold increase for HB positive as compared to HB negative patients who have disease progression. Factors associated with overall survival after disease progression include age, performance status, anemia, um, tumor stage, no, um, protocol, um, cisplatin cycles, and the type of disease progression. So whether it's a distant or local regional um, recurrence is important, as would make sense. Um, and then, interestingly, we found that salvage surgery was associated with a reduced risk um, of uh, death. And as you would expect, tobacco um, exposure was associated um, with overall survival. So um, HPV positive tumor status associated with improved overall survival at the time of disease progression, both for local regional failure and for distant um, metastases, although, you know, the curve for distant metastases doesn't look so great, and those patients are dying. They just have a longer to live with their disease, I think. Um, and um, this applies to both patients who receive surgical salvage as well as patients who do not receive surgical salvage. So HP positive tumor status is associated with improved survival at the time of disease progression. It's an independent factor associated with reduced risk of death as is surgical salvage. So surgical salvage also significantly reduces the risk of um, death um, after accounting for other important factors. So the prognostic significance of HPV tumor status after recurrence is that it's an independent marker of improved prognosis. Surgical salvage independently um, reduces risk of um, death for both HPV positive and HPV negative patients um, with recurrence. And the patterns of disease progression are similar for P16 positive, HP positive, and HP negative um, patients. So I bring this up um, in terms of, uh, you know, is there a different natural history? Can we learn anything from it? There's a lot in the literature um, about uh, unusual patterns of disease progression for HP positive patients as compared to HP negative patients with odd, distant metastases to odd and unusual sites and having a blastic um, appearance. So when we published this paper, um, we had a consortium who essentially said, you know, you're wrong. That there is a difference between HP positive recurrences and HP negative recurrences. HP positive recurrences happen much later than HPV um, negative recurrences, and they have a very different phenotype. But I think it's just a matter of how we look at the data um, and looking at it within the context of a cooperative group trial versus looking at what we see every day in our academic institutions where we're not having stringent surveillance, um, doing quarterly imaging on our patients. Um, and you know, I might see my patients on one surveillance schedule, you might see your patients on a different schedule. And so by and large, when you look at the data and look across both groups, most recurrences happen within two years. We did this um, using our data at Hopkins and Yes, we see a statistical difference in terms of time to recurrence, but when you look at it, by two years, by and large, among HPV positive patients, just like HPV negative patients, most of the recurrences um, have happened. But there remains no difference in terms of distribution of um, distant metastases. And the, um, the 
survival benefit of surgical salvage applies to both HP positive and HPV negative um, patients. So we were able to reproduce what we found in the RTOG study using our institutional data at Hopkins, and we actually added a few factors um, which were available um, to discern um, survival uh, differences, such as having multiple disease recurrences is associ associated, as you would expect, with worse overall survival. Um, so um, I think just to kind of reconcile uh, our group versus um, you know the some other people out there who think that there is a huge difference, I think it's a natural history difference, right? There are early and there are late survivors. And um, so, you know, we looked at Hopkins data to try to explain this, and I think it's survival bias. So there are early survivors, people who die, you know, in less than 24 um, months, and then there are people who survive later. And there are early survivors and there are late survivors, both among HIV positive patients and HPV negative um, patients. And so, you know, we remember and we see many more HIV positive patients these days because of the incidence um, trends that we went over earlier. And so there are just a lot more HIV positive patients and there are both early and there are late survivors um, in that. And so I think that's why we come away with this impression and which is easy in case series um, to think that recurrences are um, later and have a different um, phenotype. I think these patients are just living longer and they live longer with their disease. Um, and so we looked at that more closely with our data at Hopkins. And what you see is the overall survival difference, but there's no difference in disease-free survival after that first progression. So these people are, have their first progression, they're living longer, and while they're living longer, there's greater opportunity to have more metastases. And that's why I think we have this impression that HIV positive patients have multiple sites of um, disease. Um, so what are the implications um, for, uh, of this improved prognosis in terms of, and surgical salvage in terms of surveillance? Um, so, uh, you know, in prostate, the PSA can be used as a marker of surveillance, and um, there have been several um, groups, actually all of which from um, Hopkins, that we've looked at um, HPV as a marker of um, recurrence. In cervical cancer, E6 and E7 antibodies were um, reported to decline after either surgical um, therapy or radiation therapy. In head and neck cancer, we know that E6 seropositivity precedes um, the development of oropharyngeal cancer. This is an nested case control, um, which Amy Kramer from MCI um, did. So they thought out all the serum, went back from serum you know, 10 years um, before people were diagnosed with oropharynx cancer. And what you see is that it's present 10 years before, um, uh, before being diagnosed with oropharyngeal cancer and then um, also present year, the, the fewer years preceding um, diagnosis of oropharyngeal cancer. There were studies that showed that there was um, a decline in the number of patients who were antibody positive for E6 or E7 in head and neck cancer. But these are small studies that um, had heterogeneous anatomic sites. They had a lot of oral cavity cancers, larynx cancers, so very few oropharynx cancers. And then um, there was another study that looked at it in terms of titers. And you see that there was a decline in titer from the time of diagnosis to um, uh, follow-ups um, that was statistically significant. But again, this was a study that had very few oropharynx cancer patients in it. So we did a retrospective study using our tumor bank at Hopkins with um, patients who were HP positive and had available serology um, specimens. We looked at their clinical characteristics to find their HPV tumor status. And then we looked at um, several um, antibodies. We had a control, we performed a control using um, the BK poly polyoma um, virus. And what we saw is that broad strokes, um, when you um, look at each of the antibodies with E6 and E7 um, down here, you see that there is a decline um, in um, antibody titer across groups. And this is actual um, titers. So there was no statistical difference, largely for E1 and E2. Um, but there were differences for E6 and E7 over time with a decline um, as we got later out from um, treatment. Um, the other thing that we found, which um, to me was interesting, is that 
at the time of diagnosis, the magnitude of the HPV titer was also strongly associated with the risk of recurrence um, after adjusting for other um, factors. Um, and so I think that there is potential that we could use this as a prognostic um, risk factor um, at the time of enrollment, and maybe that's another factor that we can put into the nomogram as a biomarker um, for prognosis. There are other, um, I'm not gonna go into it, but um, there are other um, studies that look at oral HPV as a marker of recurrence, um, um, but it, where they suggest that you know patients can be um, spit in a cup, fish and gargle, and if we detect oral HPV, that there are strong risk of recurrence. Um, so um, we talked about the need for risk stratification um, and identifying the ideal candidate for risk stratification. So we have um, ECOG 3311, which will help us answer some of these questions. Um, one of the big um, areas of controversy is whether extracapsular spread is um, important in our HV positive um, patients. Um, so uh, this is ECOG 3311. It's the first um, uh, surgical cooperative group trial in a long time. Um, and it's really gauged to look at whether or not there, uh, this 10 gray difference in the inter intermediate risk group makes a difference. Um, now, the problem with this, and this is all done really because we are trying to de-intensify these patients, and so that's the reason why this study um, was designed. The problem is that many patients who are meant to go into an intermediate or low risk group are going into the high risk group because they either have extra capsular spread or they have um, positive margins. So to me, that is the unintentional, unintentional therapeutic intensification. When we're trying to de-intensify these patients, we as surgeons are clearly not doing a very good job of picking who should go um, on uh, trial and who's a good surgical candidate. So while there's controversy whether or not ECS is, um, is a prognostic marker here in a single institution study at WashU, um, they found that there's no survival difference um, in terms of ECS, but when they graded it, they found that a high grade ECS actually does matter and that ECS is associated with classically high risk features in um, head and neck cancer, which bode poor prognosis. Um, so it still is a high risk marker for us now. And so I think as a surgeon, I always look very closely to see whether or not I think that a patient has ECS because I really don't want to take that patient to the OR for them to get surgery and then end up getting chemo and radiation afterwards. So, um, you know, outside of Outside of um, clinical trial, that is still a high risk um, feature, and in, in uh, 3311. Um, and so, uh, in work here, um, uh, Dr. Butler's group has shown that our, our, um, our radiographic imaging, including CT scan, has really poor sensitivity um, for predicting extracapsular spread. And that's really the problem is when we take someone to the OR that we think looks fine on CT scan and then afterwards we get this path report that says that there was um, ECS. And so we don't have a good way right now of determining who has ECS preoperatively unless it's very obvious on um, a scan. And so we've looked to see whether or not ultrasound um, is a method that um, could help us predict um, people who have nodal metastases. So we did this in a study population of patients who have papillary thyroid cancer, um, not squamous cell cancer, um, just kind of as a proof of principle. There is overlap between papillary and squamous cell cancer in terms of um, being a cystic nodal met um, often um, in the neck. Um, but uh, these are ultrasound characteristics that two independent radiologists um, graded for. So they looked for perinodal edema, um, greater than 50% um, cystic uh, area in the node, and clear node matting, among other um, factors um, that they graded it on. And what you see is that, you know, we can increase, um, th that it's strongly associated um, with the risk of um, ECS in this study of papillary thyroid cancer. And if you use different combination of factors, we can increase the sensitivity of um, detecting ECS um, preoperatively. Um, so we've talked about incidence trends, we've talked about the clinical demographic characteristics of patients with HV positive cancers. 
and this is a group with um, good prognosis. So as you can imagine, we would expect that there are increased survivors at a population level. Um, so we used um, Danish cancer um, data. So the great thing about Denmark is it's essentially a prospective um, cohort study because all people in Denmark um, who receive health care get registered. Um, and so uh, we looked at their population-based data. Um, incidence there was increasing. Mortality from oropharynx cancer was declining. Therefore, you'd expect that survivors were increasing. And um, the prevalence of oropharynx cancer patients in the country was um, statistically um, increasing um, over time. We've also shown this um, using SEER data. So we see similar patterns in the United States where survival um, for oropharynx cancer patients has significantly improved over time. It's improved in the categories you would expect it to improve. It's improved among men, whites, and younger age cohorts. And as a result of it, we see a significantly um, increased um, uh, and it's a significant increase in the prevalence of long-term survivors from oropharynx cancer um, in the United States. So it's good prognosis. We've increased survivors, but can we do something at the other end of the spectrum? Can we um, reduce the incidence of um, this cancer? Can we apply what we've learned um, from cervical cancer, where we've seen a dramatic reduction in the incidence of cervical cancer to oropharynx cancer? And I'm not going to go through all the data. Um, but uh, the short answer is no, we can't use a pap smear um, uh, for uh, the oropharynx as we have for cervical um, cancer. What we found is that when you um, use a pap test for a lesion that you see right in front of you, um, cytologically that's strongly associated with oropharynx cancer. The presence of HPV is strongly associated with a cytologic abnormality and with cancer, but if you don't see it, um, you're not going to actually be able to sample it. And the oropharynx has, um, you know, this very cryptic lymphoid tissue, and so we think that that's really the shortcoming um, of, uh, that's the shortcoming of, um, of the pap test. Um, so um, can we use imaging to improve that? And I'm just going to show you very quickly what we've been doing with ultrasound um, work. Um, because it's a non-invasive um, method. Um, to use. So this is a cadaver. Um, this is the um, tonsil. This is the base of tongue. Um, and then submandibular gland. Similarly, on ultrasound, you see a similar image. The base of tongue, here's your, your mucosal line from um, the tongue, and here's your tonsil. This is what we see in a CT scan, where you really don't get the definition of the soft tissues um, in a CT scan. The problem is it is outside the traditional orthogonal plane, and there is a big learning curve for using ultrasound. This is an ultrasound image of the base of tongue, sagittal image. This is an analogous image using um, MRI. So um, and this is just to show you there are really cool things you can learn from ultrasound. So this is your CT scan. And granted, I'm just giving you one image of it. But you appreciate these fronds that you otherwise would not appreciate um, on standard conventional um, imaging. So, Right now, we don't have a tool to reduce the incidence of oropharynx cancer. Um, uh, so we need a better way to be able to apply the PAP test, and ideally it would be imaging, but we're really far away from doing that at this point. So let's say that we had a way to screen for these patients if we identified people who were um, at high risk. So who's at high risk in the population? So I showed you the bimodal curves earlier. This is um, using NHANES data, um, updated using um, several years of NHANES oral HPV um, data, and then looking at analogous SEER data um, to look at cancer incidence, because I could have sworn that most of these people with oral HPV infection were probably people who had cancer, but I turned out to be wrong. Um, so the incidence of cancer still remains really low among these people. Um, so let's say we had a tool, so we have a pap test and we had some imaging so that we could actually screen these people who we think are high risk. How many people would it take to screen um, to find one case of oropharynx cancer? So this is a back of the envelope calculation that we did using um, SEER data um, and NHANES data. And this is just to show you that it's a really hard calculation. It takes 10,500 people to find one case of cancer. And so we are so far away 
from secondary prevention um, is really the point. But let's say we could identify people who are at high risk, what would we do with them? So again, in the Danish Cancer Registry, we looked at the impact of tonsillectomy on future development of oropharynx cancers. And what you see in Denmark, analogous to the United States, there's been a decrease in tonsillectomies in the country and an increase in oropharynx cancer. These are not the same Y axis, axis, axis. <laughs> um, so I don't want you to think that you know, we're crossing curves here in terms of incidence of oropharynx cancer. But what we used this data was to show that a tonsillectomy actually reduces the risk of future development of oropharyngeal cancer. So um, it's associated with 60% decrease in the risk of um, cancer. So that is also, if we could identify people at risk, I think that might be an acceptable um, interventional intervention, but we are very far away from that as well. So in conclusion, HPV is an independent marker of prognosis at the time of um, both primary diagnosis and at recurrence. Um, salvage therapy is an independent marker of, an, of improved prognosis. HPV positive patients and HPV negative patients have similar time to recurrence. I think survival bias reconciles the perception of late recurrence. Um, and um, I think that we're at the point where we need to find, we, we've de shown that HPV positive patients do better than HPV negative patients and we need improved risk stratification methods. I think we need to introduce biomarkers into our risk stratification methods and hopefully we can introduce the nomograms both for patients and providers and for us in clinical trials as an improved risk stratification method. As a result of the um, incidence trends that we've um, shown and the good prognosis of our patients, I think we're finally learning that you know, we are seeing a growing prevalence of oropharynx survivors in the population um, in the US and in other um, countries. And um, as I kind of glossed over at the very end, secondary prevention is presently not feasible in the United States or anywhere um, for oropharynx cancer um, at this point. Um, and uh, hopefully the vaccines can help us in terms of primary prevention. Um, and these are all my collaborators, let's say. So I'll take questions.